So Jesus has defeated the power that held mankind captive, right? Along with God's creation. So we no longer have to live under the power of death or even under the power of the fear of death. Jesus has set us free from these things. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Megan Allen. Today, we are going to continue in our series through the book of Hebrews. In our last video, we walked through Hebrews chapter one. And today we are going to start walking through Hebrews chapter two. So have you considered all of the vast implications of Christ putting on humanity? So we know that he came to save us from our sins, right? But... What else did Christ accomplish through his life and his death and his resurrection? So we're going to explore these questions today. We're going to take a deep dive into Hebrews chapter 2, and we're going to discover what it means that we have been restored through Christ's sufferings. So we saw in Hebrews chapter 1, we took a look at how Jesus is better than the angels, right? So now in these first few verses of chapter 2, we're going to see why this truth is is so crucial in God's grand design and plan for salvation. So let's go ahead and read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. For this reason, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty... How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. So a little context before we get into it, okay? So this verse is comparing the word spoken by angels through Moses. And Moses was the one who gave the law or the old covenant, right? To that which God has spoken in Jesus that which he has spoken in his son. So Hebrews 1 established that the word spoken through Jesus is better than the word spoken through angels. So let's take a look at the meaning of a couple of these words. So first of all, this word attention, to pay attention, it means to hold the mind towards, to apply oneself to, to be given to. And then this word drift means to slip from the mind. And also, this verb for pay attention is in the present tense. So this means that it's something that we must continue to walk in. It's not something that we just listen to or pay attention to one time. We need to hold our minds toward what God has spoken and apply ourselves to it every single day. Otherwise, we're in danger of drifting away from it. We're in danger of allowing what God has spoken to slip and drift from our minds. And we also see that much of what was spoken through the prophets and the fathers was delivered through angels, right? Galatians 3, 19. Why the law then? It was added on account of the violations having been ordered through angels at the hand of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. So the author of Hebrews is warning his readers to listen, again, to listen to what God has spoken in his son. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And if the word ordered through angels has proven to be true and unchanging, we must listen to the word that God has spoken in his son, right? Why? Because the son is better than the angels. That's what the author accomplished in chapter one. We saw that the son is better than the angels. The word spoken through the son is better than the word spoken through angels. Verses three and four. After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. Okay, so here is where we learn a little piece of important information about the author of Hebrews, right? So some scholars believe that Paul was the author of Hebrews. Um, others do not, because this verse 
shows us that the author was not a first generation Christian. He heard the message secondhand from someone else who heard it from the Lord. Okay, that's what we see in verses three and four. At first it was spoken through the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard. So if we go read Acts chapter nine, we learn that Paul heard the gospel firsthand from Jesus, right? He was on the road to Damascus when Jesus appeared to him in that blinding light. So that made Paul an eyewitness. So we also learn um, in the following verses that this word from God, this message of salvation was testified by signs and wonders, right? So the author of Hebrews is saying that there is an abundance of evidence to this truth. There's a bunch of verifiable evidence pointing back to prove the word that God has spoken in his son. For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking. But one has testified somewhere saying, what is man that you remember him or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Okay, so this portion can be a little confusing um, when scripture refers to the son of man, because sometimes it means Jesus and other times it's referring to someone else. And if we continue reading through verse nine, we see that the him in verse nine is not the same him as in verses five through eight, but we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels. So if we go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, um, this passage helps us understand that this passage in Hebrews 2 is not referring to Jesus, the Son of Man. It's referring to mankind. Okay, so I'm going to read. This is Genesis um, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the author is saying that God's original plan for mankind was to rule the earth. But because of sin, Satan came in and he took this over. Let's keep reading in Genesis. This is chapter three. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your, ch- your pain and childbirth. In pain, you shall deliver children. Yet your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. With hard labor, you shall eat from it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you. Yet you shall eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So, What the author of Hebrews is trying to show us here is that God has redeemed us back to himself through Christ, right? So while the world is still under subjection to Satan and to his rule and to his powers, those of us who are sealed with the spirit no longer have to live under this rule. We've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority. That's from Ephesians chapter two, right? And scripture promises that one day we will rule with Christ in the earth. Revelation 20 verses four through six, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. They will be priests of God and Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now we start seeing the author make a very important connection, um, 
to Jesus and to mankind. So let's continue reading in verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of his suffering death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we learn from Romans 5 verses 14 through 19 that man lost dominion over the earth through the sin of Adam. And through this one man's sin, death entered the world. So death now reigned over mankind. God gave man dominion over the earth, but man forfeited this power, right? He forfeited this right and this support, this authority. And the principle of death took away that power to rule. So in order for Jesus to regain this dominion, he had to conquer that which held mankind captive, right? This is a quote from um, David Guzik. He's one of my favorite commentators. He said, Jesus came and through his humility and suffering, he defeated the power of death and made possible the fulfillment of God's promise that mankind will have dominion over the earth fulfilled both through Jesus' own dominion and the rule of believers with him. Let's go on to verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, so that through death he might destroy the one that has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to to the descendants of Abraham. So Jesus has defeated the power that held mankind captive, right? Along with God's creation. So we no longer have to live under the power of death or even under the power of the fear of death. Jesus has set us free from these things. Back up to verse 10 now. It says, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying i will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation i will sing your praise and again i will put my trust in him and again behold i and the children whom god has given me. So this word perfect up here with the orange circle around it means to complete or accomplish. So we also learn, and we're going to see this when we get to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So it's interesting that this passage says that Jesus was made perfect, right? Doesn't this imply that he wasn't perfect in some way? So we know that Jesus was a hundred percent completely perfect and flawless in his deity and in his character, right? However, in order to become the savior of humanity, he had to experience humanity. So again, this is um, another thought from David Guzik. He says, if God the Son did not add humanity to his deity, then he could never experience the suffering of death on our behalf. So suffering is a part of the human life and the human experience, right? So in order to save us, he had to experience suffering. And I find it so comforting to know that I serve and worship a God who understands these hardships and these difficulties, right? Um, Hebrews 4 talks about he is not a God who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but he was tempted in every way, just as we are yet without sin. So because he put on flesh, he understands the human experience, right? He understands our pain. He cares deeply about our hurts and our cares and our fears, he is not far off. He is close, not only in proximity. He's always with us, right? But he also is close in his experience. He came and suffered so that he could become our savior and to give us a hope 
in a future where there will be no more suffering. And that is what we have to look forward to. Verse 17, therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. So the sacrifice of Jesus appeased or satisfied God pertaining to our sin, right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So Jesus put on flesh not only to redeem the authority that mankind lost in the fall, but also to make a way for mankind to be placed back in a right relationship with God. And what this means for you and I is that there is no longer anything that can take away or sever this position that we have been given in Christ. It's a position of holiness, of sonship, eternal life. We've become children of God. We have been sealed with the Spirit as a guarantee that we belong to God. This is our identity. God is our Father. We are His children. And we can rest and find joy in that knowledge. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. If this video was encouraging to you, please let me know. Hit that like button. Leave me a comment and subscribe so you don't miss any future videos. Also, make sure you come and join us at the Girls in the Word Facebook group where we study and discuss God's Word together. I'll make sure I leave a link in the description below. We would love to see you there. And thank you so much for watching.